Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore. Today, we are going to be talking about how the Imperium defends itself, which is a hell of a lot more complex a topic than you might originally think. The Imperium is quite the sizable little lad, after all, and defending all that space is easier said than done. But before that, a quick little plug. Now, I usually wouldn't chill my merchandise so quickly after I'd already done it, but Teespring is currently doing a campaign where you can get 10% off on merchandise, so I figured I'd mention it. The code you need to enter to get access to the 10% discount is down in the description below, along with a link to the merchandise store. And with that out of the way, let us get on with the show. The Imperium of Man is vast. It is by far the single largest power within the 41st millennium. It covers quadrillions of miles. It contains within it millions of inhabited planets and billions of uninhabitable asteroids and worlds utilized for mining operations, observation purposes, or even gargantuan space-based dockyards for the Imperial Navy. These innumerable holdings provide the Imperium with a rich bounty of men, materiel, and resources. Fed into planet-sized refineries and factories where entire populations slave away at mile-long assembly lines, whose produce is used for the expansion, the maintenance, and the defense of the Imperium. Now that last bit is of particular import. For whilst humanity possesses the indisputably largest empire in the galaxy, that does by no stretch of the imagination mean that they are alone in the galaxy, and the Imperium's dominion over it is far from uncontested. And that of course is where the real problem sets in. How do you defend quadrillions of miles of space, millions of planets, and billions upon billions of satellites, mining outposts, off-world refineries, observatories, bases, naval dockyards, spy platforms, orbital weapon platforms, testing sites, etc, etc, etc. Even with the seemingly unexhaustible manpower resources of the Imperium, there simply aren't enough bodies to go around. There's an orc warg in the offing over there, a Terranid Hive fleet is coming down from over yonder, and there's a bunch of overly ambitious communist blueberries down south causing troubles as well. The Imperial Guard is stretched far too thin to cover everything, and the mighty Adeptus Astartes even more so. The old saying, he who defends everything defends nothing, has never been more true than in the modern day Imperium. And so how do they do it? Because the Imperium is still there. It's been the dominant force in the galaxy for 10,000 years. Clearly, it's doing something right. In part, the Imperium's ability to defend itself stems from the fact that it is a vast and unbelievably intricate machine. In the Imperium of Man, a human life is nothing more than a resource, a cog in a far greater whole, and it has to be this way for the Imperium to survive. Things such as liberties, rights, or the pursuit of a halfway decent life, much less so happiness, are all things that must, on occasion, and indeed frequently, be sacrificed in the name of the Imperium's greater needs. As mentioned, entire populations slave away at factory lines, with no hope of ever escaping their allotted position in life. This uncaring approach to the utilization and expenditure of human resources allows the Imperium to operate far more effectively than would otherwise be possible, and this ruthlessness also allows the Imperium a great deal more in the way of specialization as well. A single forge world, utilizing its human resources to the fullest of its potential, whilst drawing upon refined resources sent to it from other specialized plans in the sector, could produce enough refined material to fulfill an entire subsector's need of processed goods. Whilst in turn, the Forge World's needs for food, for example, could be fulfilled by yet further specialized agri worlds. Others might specialize in trade or the manufacturing of particular parts, 
memory banks, solar emitters, plasma weaponry, or even civilian goods. For even the Imperium, as oppressive a force as it is, understands that complacent civilians are far easier to control than angry ones. And of course, there are also worlds dedicated to far more martial pursuits. Worlds that specialize in the production of men for the Imperial Guard, or who produces the vast spaceships that service the Imperial Navy. And of course, entire planets kept in a feral, uncivilized state of existence so as to provide better recruits for the Adeptus Astartes. And some worlds are even turned into planet-sized fortifications for the protection of other vital resources or due to their strategic location within the galaxy. As the Imperium of Man and virtually all other species are utterly reliant upon warp lanes, which vary considerably in their stability, there are areas of the galaxy that present natural choke points. Areas where fortified worlds studded with orbital defense laser silos and torpedo batteries could provide a great deal of trouble to anyone attempting to pass by. And these fortifications could be further strengthened by permanent stations of the Imperial Navy and orbital defense stations, equipped with super heavy Navy grade weaponry, able to engage enemy fleet sized formations at astonishing ranges. But, unfortunately, these massive installations are unbelievably pricey. Not only is an entire world surrendered to a purely defensive purpose, but the weapons required, the men required, the resources required to feed and maintain both the men, the planet, the fences, the laser batteries, the defense stations, the Imperial Navy elements, etc. It all requires an astronomical amount of financing. And even if that financing is available, which in many cases it is, if it defends an important heartland of the Imperium, or a particularly wealthy noble's favoured summer villa, then in many cases, space itself is simply not on the Imperium's side. Whilst there certainly are stable warplanes, and there are areas in which the stable warplanes are so rare that such fortifications are both possible and viable, those areas are a rarity in the Imperium of Man, and in most cases, there will be ways around even the most heavily fortified of positions. Just because the warplanes around it may not be safe, does not necessarily mean that they are introversible, it just means that you need a hint of desperation to try. So what about the rest of the Imperium? The 99.9% .9 that doesn't have the benefit of nature providing a handy choke point for them to sit behind? Well, their safety is handed over to another Imperial system that is as effective as it is cold and uncaring. A doctrine best described as layered proportional response. To fully understand this strategy, and why it works so well for the Imperium, we first need to have a look at the Imperium in total. It is divided into four segmentum, Obscurus, Pacificus, Tempestus, and Ultima. These four are then ruled from a fifth segmentum, Segmentum Solar, where the High Lords of Terra rule from the home world of humanity itself, neighbouring of course the almost equally important world of Mars. Each one of these segmentums maintains its own de facto government, under the control of course of Segmentum Solar, which maintains the overarching government of the Imperium of Man. They maintain their own militaries, their own administratum staff, their own bonds with the adepts of Mars and the machine gods, etc, etc. They are, for all intents and purposes, self-contained entities within the Imperium. Further, the Imperium is then divided into sub-sectors. Here we can see a few examples, Reductus Sector, Sheridan Sector, and, a slightly unusual one, the Realm of Ultramar. These subsectors again also have their own local governments, a sort of 
Segmentum Command in miniature, where you have Subsector, Imperial Guard Headquarters, Administratum Officers, and so on and so on. But, at the end of the day, this is nothing more than a generalization. The Realm of Ultramar is one exception, it being ruled over, de facto, by the Ultramarines chapter of the Adeptus Astartes, and their various successor chapters. And there are many such exceptions within the Imperium. This is a necessity due to the sheer scale of the Imperium. Segmentum Solar worries itself primarily with the running of Segmentum Solar, and whilst the High Lords of Terror have hundreds if not thousands of issues placed before them every day that pertains to the various issues of running the Segmentums, the Sectors, or indeed even potentially Solar Systems or individual campaigns, by and large, the subsectors, the segmentums, the sectors, the solar systems, and the planets are left to their own devices. As long as they pay their allotted tithe to the Imperium, be it in men, material, food, resources of any kind, then they are, by and large, left to their own devices. This in turn means that there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of different types of governments, of religion, of tradition, of culture, etc. within the Imperium, and yes, even religion. Whilst the worship of the Emperor is of course universal and enforced by the central authorities, that worship can take many, many forms. The feral savages of one world may worship the Emperor as a sun god, as the literal sun. Whilst the population of a rich, high world that has made its money off trade may view him as a benevolent spirit that has to do with finance, who in his infinite wisdom and mercy brings prosperity onto those who worship him. The population of a ocean world may view him as the ocean itself, the bringer and giver of all life, of food, of nutrients, of safety and security but also the taker of life in the aspect of an uncompromising storm. The Imperium is, no joke intended, incredibly diverse. And this has its advantages, allowing the various solar systems, segmentums, yada 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 yada, to determine their own forms of government, their own structures, etc., as long as they pay their taxes, is probably the only way you could potentially run an Imperium of this size when communication is literally done through the mental equivalent of interpretive dance. Even the most painstakingly well laid out instructions sent from the Segmentum Solar would only have about a 50-50 chance of reaching the end of Segmentum Tempestus with something at least vaguely resembling the original meaning still intact within the message. So micromanaging is already basically impossible simply just due to the scale of the Imperium and the problems involved in communicating across the Imperium, and when you then add on the potential complications of local custom, on this world for example, we do not pronounce S's. Indeed, the letter is banned because the world in question one had a particularly brutal governor who infatuation with the letter wauch that he would literally crucify people on giant tattoo formed like the letter. Now of course, there is absolutely no way in the good god emperor's beloved rucksack that some administratum drone would know this and so he would add in the letter S in various communications to that planet, and the next time he would hear from them was when they declared independence from the Imperium after being insulted in the most grave and horrifying manner possible. So yeah, micromanagement is not really an option here, but this system of delegated responsibility has worked out pretty well so far. As long as the Imperium is able to set and enforce the tithes levied upon each individual planet, they could care less if the people there don't like the letter S or not. And whilst this has proven to be a relatively effective way of running a galaxy-spanning empire, considering the technical limitations and so on and so on, it does have a few weaknesses. The military one being perhaps the most pronounced and of course the most relevant to today's video. We are finally back on the topic of defense once again. Each and every planet within the Imperium is obligated to maintain a basic level of self-defense capabilities. 
These self-defense forces vary as much in quality, equipment, in training, in organization, etc., etc., as all of the various planets within the Imperium, but they are generally referred to as PDF, Planetary Defense Forces. And like the name implies, they universally occupy themselves with the business of defending their home world, leaving the defense of the rest of the Imperium up to the Imperial Guard with the two entities being, in all due essentiality, entirely separate, as far as command structure goes, as far as supplies, training, doctrine, etc, etc. There are, again, as always within the Imperium, exceptions. There are certain planets, for example, that maintain extraordinarily well-equipped and high-quality planetary defense forces, but those are the exception rather than the rule. And there are even planets who keep their best and brightest men back in the PDF and send the rebel off to the Imperial Guard, whereas normally it is the exact opposite, where the best and brightest of the PDF can either volunteer or are on occasion conscripted into Imperial Guard service. The PDF are the ones responsible for the immediate defense of the planet should it be invaded, although this, in all due reality, is not their primary occupation. Of course, defending the world is what they do, but mostly they are not expected to stand up to external threats. The PDF are instead an internal security device. These various planets, of course, have their own local police forces, occasionally supported by the Imperial Police Force, the Adeptus Arbites, but by and large, there are very rarely any considerable numbers of Arbites on any single planet. Indeed, entire solar systems, or subsectors in some occasions, could all be serviced by only one or two official Arbites personnel. Instead, they rely upon local law enforcements. Their job is, of course, enforcing local law. But with the Imperium being what it is, rather authoritarian and brutal, and with the ever-present danger of chaos or gene seal infestations, or simply just Imperial citizens that figure that they have gotten a raw deal and that they could do way better on their own, well, uprising are not as uncommon as one might at first think. And whilst, once again, local law enforcement and Adeptus Arbites will be the first to attempt to quell such unrest, the PDF's primary job, in all due reality, is taking care of these internal schisms and problems. Whilst should the planet be invaded by an external force, then, once again, as mentioned, the PDF will be the first line of defense in all due likelihood, but they are not really trained, equipped, or organized to fight a global conflict. By and large, PDF formations are considered second and third line formations. They are often equipped with outdated solid slug weaponry. They may also not have access to Vox beads, allowing communication within the squad. Instead, they may have a single Vox caster operated by the radio operator. They will also usually not have much in the way of heavy equipment, and what they do have will be outdated or indeed even locally produced tanks, vehicles or aircraft, which will almost universally be considerably cruder and less efficient than their Imperial Guard equivalents. And the same also goes for their training and doctrine. They are simply not trained in operating on a global scale. They are, at best, capable of defending their local areas, digging in around important objectives, hive cities, refineries, power plants, orbital defense batteries, executing an active defense of their homeworld, including counterattacks, large-scale operations, and mobile warfare, is simply far beyond what they have been trained to do or equipped to do. So what is the point, then? with maintaining a PDF at all. Why not simply roll them into the local law enforcement as a more heavily armed branch, using them de facto as somewhat overgeared riot police? It is because, whilst the PDF are not expected to be able to defeat a proper planetary invasion, anything beyond a small-scale raid, essentially, they will slow down the attacker. And this is vital, not so much because the Imperium needs time to formulate a response, but more so that the Imperium can figure out precisely how hard it is getting hit. If, say, for example, the enemy only conquers a single world, 
the Imperium might not even register that for decades, if not centuries, due to the simple fact that the loss of a single world is, frankly, not that much of a priority. By the time that world's distress signal reaches someone with the authority to do something, with the capabilities to do something, and the leeway to do something, years upon years could have passed. And the simple reason for that is, the Imperium might simply have other priorities. Other areas of the Imperium may be under attack from far more ferocious forces, but how precisely does the Imperium even determine this? If a single report can, as I mentioned, get so lost, so buried within the Imperial bureaucracy that it can take decades or even centuries for the news of that world's loss to reach somebody that can actually do something about it, how does it react? Well, that's where the layered part of layered proportional response comes in. When a world is attacked, it will dispatch a distress call via astropathic means. That will reach the nearby worlds, and they will begin to react to that distress call. The first thing a planet will do is begin to shore up its own defenses. Virtually all Imperial worlds will have some degree of military infrastructure, if nothing more than for its local PDF. This will include things like barracks, fortifications, trenches, perhaps even orbital defense batteries, or, in the case of some particularly valuable worlds, their own space defense force. Although even the worlds that possess their own space force, it will usually only consist of a handful of fairly small vessels, enough to see off the occasional pirate raid perhaps, but nothing that will significantly slow down a planetary invasion force. But of course, military infrastructure costs a lot to maintain, and so in times of relative peace and stability, many planetary governors will choose to deprioritize the maintenance of such infrastructure in favor of further civilian, industrial, or indeed, personal gains. And particularly, heavy fortification like major planetary defense laser batteries and torpedo silos require a lot of cash to keep operational to their fullest capacity. When their world comes under direct threat, however, or even potentially when a neighboring world comes under direct threat, depending upon how optimistic the local planetary governor may be, that is often considered a very good reason to start increasing the military's budget again. And of course, whilst all of these fancy emplacements, laser defense batteries, bunkers, trenches, etc. are all well and good, you need men to actually man them as well. And so the next obvious step is to increase the rate at which the PDF recruits troops. This in turn also allows the PDF to be ready to discharge its more veteran personnel into Imperial Guard regiments, which may or may not be levied. At this point, the planet is just about as well defended as it ever will be just by its lonesome. The size of the PDF has been increased to the limits that the local economy will allow, and occasionally a hint or two beyond, and the local defense infrastructure, trenches, bunkers, defensive platforms, etc., have also all been brought back up to ready standards. What happens next is dependent upon what is currently going on with the first world to be attacked. If it is still offering resistance, then in all due likelihood, the news will arrive at local command, informing them that a world is under attack, the neighboring worlds have completed their defensive preparations, and are now requesting, usually in fairly strident language, further instructions and reinforcements. Local command will then have a look at the tithe rating of those worlds, to determine precisely how important they are to the wider Imperium, how much resources could be expended upon defending them, and to determine how many Imperial Guard regiments the world may reasonably expected to raise in its own defense. Then, assuming the Imperium has decided that these worlds are indeed worth defending, materiel will be dispatched from Imperial Guard storages across the galaxy. Weapons, armor, comms equipments, vehicles, 
and if at all possible, veteran personnel from other Imperial Guard regiments to help lead, train, and integrate the newcomers. Preferably, this personnel will come from regiments that have already been raised from the world in question in the past, and have spent quite a few years campaigning across the Imperium with the Imperial Guard. And then, depending upon the scope and scale of the founding, be it one regiment, two, three, or perhaps as much as a dozen, additional Imperial personnel will also be dispatched. Almost regardless of the size of the founding, at least one officer of the Officio Prefectus will be sent, as the newbies often require the stern, guiding hands of an Imperial Commissar to ensure that they understand fully what is expected of them. If the regiments in question also possess a large number of vehicles, be it tanks, APCs, or anything else, then representatives of the Adeptus Mechanicus will also be dispatched, at first in a training and advisory capacity. Generally speaking, the Adepts of the Machine God are far too important to waste on small local regiments. Instead, they are sent to train and instruct local personnel in how to carry out most of the required maintenance, with perhaps only one or two adepts, depending upon the size of the formation, remaining behind to ensure that the proper rites are continued to be taught and executed. And if it is a particularly large founding, with advanced communication needs, then astropaths of the Adeptus Astrotelepathica may also be sent. This whole procedure can, as you can probably already imagine, vary quite considerably in the length of time required to see it to completion, depending upon the availability of manpower, of equipment, of command personnel, of how much shit local command has to deal with at any one point, and so on and so on. But in theory, this is supposed to be the immediate rapid reaction response of the Imperium to a threat. Now what happens if the First World has not been able to resist the invader, and has instead been overrun rather quickly? In that case, the Imperium once again begins gathering information. How many of the worlds next in line are currently being attacked? What is the strength of the attack being directed against those worlds, and how are their now ready defences holding up to the onslaught? If, for example, only a single more world is under attack and is doing relatively well, then in all due likelihood this is a fairly minor incursion, and the planets that have already started preparing themselves for an invasion, and possibly also started raising Imperial Guard regiments, should be more than enough to halt the invasion, and then counterattack to reclaim the planets with their Imperial Guard forces, possibly with one or two more veteran regiments being sent in from the surrounding planets to help out. If the next world in the line, however, is being attacked with considerable ferocity, then it too will send out a distress call, just like the first world, and this signal will then reach all of the planets surrounding this planet, sending yet further worlds into a preparatory phase where they begin preparing their own defences and potentially also raising yet further Imperial Guard regiments. If two worlds are attacked, then the same thing happens again, but both of them sends out their own distress signals, bringing yet further worlds into a preparatory state, and so on and so on and so on. Essentially, every single world that is attacked is a warning beacon to every surrounding world. All of those worlds then begin first their own defensive preparations, and then begin preparations for Imperial Guard regiments. This means that any invader moving and deeper into the Imperium will face ever stiffening resistance the deeper in it goes, and ideally it will be stopped by local resistance. Eventually it'll run into the third or fourth planet and it will be unable to break through, since it will have had enough time to both prepare its own defences and raise Imperial Guard regiments along with possibly reinforcements from the surrounding planets as well. Then, once the enemy's advance has been checked, all of the planets that has been put on alert so far will then begin pushing back. Yet further Imperial Guard regiments will be raised both from these planets and every planet that have been worn so far, and they will launch a counterattack, slowly but surely reclaiming the lost worlds. In this ideal scenario, the wider Imperium needs do nothing, as the local forces will take care of all of the fighting. 
This in turn means that Sector Command or Subsector Command does not need to dispatch valuable veteran Imperial Guard forces to take care of what was essentially a minor localized conflict. A minor localized conflict that will in all due likelihood claim the lives of billions, but hey, everything is relative. And this, of course, is the proportional part of layered proportional response. If a threat can be dealt with on the local level, then it should be dealt with on the local level, to ensure that the wider Imperium does not bear the burden of this engagement, and to ensure that the minimum amount of resources are expended in neutralizing the threat. If, however, it is a major threat, a large-scale incursion, then a different solution will have to be implemented. In many cases, these threats will be detected long before they actually attack their first Imperial world. In the case of the Orcs, for example, it is often fairly easy to see when they'll turn into a real problem. Most of the time, the various Orc strongholds across the galaxy, be it a single planet or a small mini-empire, will be far too busy with good old-fashioned infighting, as the various tribes are constantly fighting against each other to prove who is the biggest and the baddest who has the most favour of Gork or Mork, or possibly even both of them. And as long as they are busy fighting one another, the Imperium by and large will simply allow them to keep doing whatever they are currently doing. As a general rule of thumb, the Imperium will only bother attempting to reclaim Orc worlds, either when it is a part of an ongoing campaign and so the Orcs are already riled up, if they absolutely have to reclaim the worlds in question, or if they are absolutely sure that they can reclaim the worlds in question. If, however, it is an Orc Empire currently engaged in what can potentially be centuries or millennia's long periods of infighting, then by all means the Imperium says, let them play with one another, because if the Imperium then begins to poke them, it will have a major incursion on its hands, as Orcs by and large find it far more amusing to fight humans than one another. But, of course, every now and then, a particularly lucky, strong, tough, or sneaky Orc Warlord will appear and begin unifying large numbers of tribes. Once this unification starts hitting critical mass, tribes will even begin flocking to this dominant warlord's banner. Once this happens, an Orc Warg is almost certainly in the offing. At this point, nearby Imperial worlds will usually be instructed to start clenching their buttholes very, very tight indeed, because shit is about to hit the fan. But ideally, the Imperium will deal with these problems before they become problems. As I mentioned, most of these larger Orc holdings are kept under fairly intense scrutiny, so if a Warlord appears to be gaining a little bit too much traction, the Imperium will organize an accident for the Warlord in question attempting to leave behind as little evidence as possible, or as much evidence as possible to make the orcs point fingers at one another, and then simply just allow the orcs to continue playing whack the greenskin for another century or two. If, however, a threat cannot be averted early and it develops into a major assault upon the Imperium, then what happens is the usual procedure is implemented. However, the attack is spreading so quickly that local worlds simply are not able to muster an adequate response to it. A world is overrun in months. The next one is attacked months after that, and so on and so on. And even at the best of times, it will take months to raise a proper Imperial Guard regiment. In these cases, the loss of worlds will happen relatively quickly. More and more worlds will then be warned about the impending catastrophe, and the calls for the attention of local command will become ever more strident. Subsector command will happily ignore one or two distress calls, but two or three dozen distress calls, and shit starts getting serious, at which point far more worlds will begin receiving the call to arms. Then Imperial Guard regiments will be rallied from worlds further and further afield, until sufficient force has been gathered to stop the encroaching enemy and then eventually start rolling them back. 
Depending upon how ferocious the enemy assault is, this may also draw in already deployed Imperial Guard regiments. Now this is a bit more of a difficult situation because by and large, Imperial Guard regiments are almost always busy doing something. The Imperium is involved in so many conflicts on so many fronts that Imperial Guard regiments simply sitting around and enjoying a leisurely existence are rare indeed. As such, there are rarely standing reserves available for Sector Command to draw upon. This in turn obviously necessitates that they find men somewhere else. This is why worlds like Krieg are so incredibly important, a planet that can provide both near limitless manpower and the material to equip those men with, able to provide ready-made solutions to any of the Imperium's military needs. But sadly, such paradise worlds, such utopias, at least by the definition of the Adeptus Administratum and Officio Monitorum, are rare. And so most Imperial commanders will have to look far and wide for their troops. Usually, any large-scale Imperial Guard response will consist of Imperial Guard regiments taken from dozens upon dozens of worlds. Many of these worlds will also specialize in providing particular types of Imperial Guard regiments. One may, for example, have a long and proud history of creating light infantry. Another might be the exact opposite, focusing on heavy mechanized infantry. Another may be a high-tech world that specializes in creating air mobile forces, whilst yet others might be quite fond of very, very large guns that go boom quite rapidly. And it is the job of the poor and unfortunate Imperial Guard commander that has been given the duty of organizing and leading this Imperial Guard army to find all of the troops he needs, to then equip all of the troops he needs, and then also convince the Imperial Navy to get them to wherever they need to be. And that's of course before he even begins entering into negotiations with forces like the Adeptus Mechanicus, the Titanicus, or the Astartes all forces that technically he has no real authority over, and the best he can do is kindly ask them for some help. Unsurprisingly, this process is a shade on the complicated side. And if an Imperial Guard General with an army of Administratum personnel, clerks and staff officers is able to put together a functioning army within a year or two, then he will be viewed by his peers as an exceptional organizer. But unfortunately for the poor planets currently under attack, a year or possibly a hell of a lot more spent in merely preparing to begin moving the reinforcements, well, a lot of very unfortunate things can happen in a year. Assuming the situation has not changed too drastically, then this new Imperial Guard army will hopefully be enough to stabilize the situation and eventually, with yet further reinforcements streaming in, both due to the organizational capacities of the new command structure and due to the surrounding worlds levying yet further Imperial Guard regiments, the enemy can first be stopped and then eventually reversed with the long-term goal of this deployment being both to regain all of the lost territory, resettle, rebuild, and occasionally, depending on the nature of the foe, flat out recolonize the worlds that have fallen. In some cases, for example, where they have fallen to enemies like Chaos or the Tau, then the original population may no longer be fit Imperial servants, and will have to be moved to somewhere considerably less hospitable, where it is hoped that they will expire naturally over the next few millennia, preferably whilst doing something useful like mining raw iron, for example. There is of course a slightly more uh, extreme option as well, in which the population is no longer a concern because the planet as a whole is no longer a concern but these are measures only taken in the most extreme of circumstances. Even though the Imperium has a lot of planets, those things don't exactly grow on trees, and it's rather difficult to replace one once permanently expunged. 
But occasionally, not even this deployment of force will be enough to stop and reverse an enemy encroachment. The Imperium is always acting on outdated and imperfect information. As I mentioned previously, the primary and virtually only way of communicating across interstellar distances in the 41st millennium is through astropathic communication, an imperfect science even at the best of times. Even the most highly skilled telepaths may misinterpret a symbol or misread the meaning of a particular scene or image, and therefore provide command with a mostly but not entirely accurate depiction of events. And one also needs to take into consideration that these reports that are being sent to Imperial High Command are being compiled and reported on by world's officials and personnel currently experiencing a planet-wide mass invasion, often by enemies they have, at the very best, a very limited understanding of. Once again, as you can probably imagine, this leads to less than accurate reporting. And so, the strength and the ferocity of the enemy's advance is understated. Dozens of worlds fall far too quickly, the Imperial response is far too slow, and when it arrives, is far too small to do much more than feed yet further men into the furnace. Or perhaps, quite simply, the whims and wills of Lady Victory is simply not on the Imperium's side in that particular campaign, and whilst the initial force may have been adequate to stop the invasion, the Imperial commander made a series of mistakes, leading to the defeat and potentially even the annihilation of his forces. In these cases, the distress signal will be sent even wider. More and more worlds will start pumping out their own distress beacons, dragging more and more Imperial resources into the fight, and higher and higher levels of Imperial command will start getting involved, eventually reaching all the way up to Segmentum Command, or possibly even garnering the attentions of the High Lords. And so, ever so slowly and ever so carefully at first, the mighty wheels and cogs of the Adeptus Administratum and Officio Monitorum will begin to turn. More and more Imperial Guard regiments will be raised, further and further already established formations will be sent into the battle, Adeptus Astartes companies and then entire chapters may get involved. The god machines of the Adeptus Mechanicus may march forth. Indeed, the Adeptus Mechanicus itself might even go to war to protect their precious forge worlds and reclaim those lost. Eventually, the sheer weight of the Imperium's near-infinite manpower and resources will grind virtually any enemy to a halt. After which, the question is how to regain the territories lost. In the case of a large-scale threat, then the forces already levied may be enough to begin a counter-offensive and, slowly but surely, regain the planets. But if this was a particularly vile and horrifying threat that required so much of the Imperium's resources to halt that there simply was not enough reserves to launch a counter-offensive, then those areas may, for the time being, be abandoned to the tender mercies of the Imperium's enemies. But the Imperium of Man has a very, very, very long memory and sooner or later it will wish to reclaim what was lost. It may even be the case that once the defensive campaign is considered to have come to an end, the High Lords of Terror may already have decreed that plans be set into motion to reclaim the lost territories via the largest scale military deployment that the Imperium is capable of amassing. These huge campaigns containing billions of men, thousands of regiments, hundreds of ships, and representatives of all branches of the Imperium's vast military are often referred to as Crusades. And the man put in charge of leading such a massive military undertaking is often bestowed upon an ancient title whose origin and original purpose is long lost in the mists of time. Warmaster.
Some would say that to grant such a title to a man with such near unparalleled command over the Imperium's military might seems like tempting fate, whilst others might argue that there's no way Lightning would strike the same name twice. Which one is right? Well, that often varies upon which history you are currently reading. But with that, I will wrap up this video. Hopefully you'll now have a better understanding of how the Imperium reacts to outside threats by gradually determining the strength of the enemy's attack, by sacrificing worlds if necessary to do so, and then reacting appropriately based on the amount of blood that flows throughout the galaxy. It certainly is a cold and callous way of reacting, but it is also one that gives a surprisingly good image of just how large the threat may be. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.